started, folks. <clears throat> Let me remind you that in the schedule section of the 4760 web page, there is a list of all of the due dates for all of the assignments. And you will notice that there are three items due in your lab section this week. Three items. There's the report from last week, the Lab 3 report. There is the Lab 4 homework. And there is the Lab 5 homework, which is the final project proposal. All due at the beginning of your lab period. So you need to front load this a little bit, get to work particularly on the proposal so you don't have everything packed in the four hours that you're trying to sleep before lab. Any questions about any of that? On the proposal, we're supposed to um, write about the standards that apply to art. Is it, do we just need to like list the standards we think apply, or should we go into detail about it? Well, I'd say a sentence or two. Okay. So if you're going to generate a television signal, that you could generate a real-time television signal on these microcontrollers. Uh, there's a lot of data on it. There's lots of projects that use that. I just didn't happen to cover it this year. Uh, then you should talk about RS-170. If you're going to use serial communication, you should talk about uh, uh, RS-232. If you're going to use Wi-Fi, you might want to, or, or let's say that you want to use some 434 megahertz radio that costs four dollars and fifty cents you're using it because it's cheap uh, you better talk about the FCC standards that are relevant for ISM band radios and just wanted to add these are all ABIT uh, requirements for paper these are all ABIT, requ ABIT requirements yes and uh, also it's good practice if you think there's any safety issue, let's say you're going to shine a laser beam around the room. If, you, if you're going to control a microwave oven with the microcontroller, I don't know why you'd want to do that. I hate to think why you might want to do that. I want to hear something about safety. If you're going to put out a lot of RF, you need to talk about safety. We put, yeah, anything, anything that might be a safety requirement. Video games, flickering, you know, has a specific health hazard. Flickering video games can, can drive a, a small percentage of the population above 0.1% uh, into seizures. Need to talk about that. Any other questions about the proposals that are due this week in lab? We need to get them this week so the TAs can spend a lovely time over break grading them. Get them back to you the week after break. Lab 4 is split half before break, half after break. I. How many people are going to be in town the, f w the Sunday at the end of break? Most of you. So having a lab period that night would be useful. But we'll have to see if there's going to be a TA here then, but we'll try and do that. Any other questions about lab three in terms of write-up? about lab four. So for lab four for motor controller we started talking about <clears throat> tiny real-time last time and gave you one example of some code. Wrote out two tasks which are going to be concurrent tasks. One thing we haven't talked about for this program is the is main how do you set everything up we're going to talk about that next. Then I want to talk a little bit about the tiny real-time API. How do you? What kind of what kind of functionality is available for you to use? Then I'll 
either do another example or talk about PID controllers. I'm not sure which. Probably PID controllers first. Motor control algorithms. How many people have taken a control course know about PID? A few. Okay. So, were there any questions about the code I wrote out last time of um, these two, these two uh, processes or tasks? Well, let's go ahead then and talk about main, which is where everything is set up. Yeah. Is there a reason the example code run at 20 megahertz? Yeah, I was using 20 megahertz crystal. So but it should, technically should work perfectly fine on the 16. Works fine at 16, but you do need to edit TRT settings.h. Now don't change the crystal out. Uh, not this is this is not a, a sufficiently good reason to change the crystal at least. Just change the setting, it's easier. So, question? Yeah. So, uh, we're setting up s port C is output, and zeroing everything. What did this program do? Oh, yes, it reads port B and turns on LEDs on port C and passes information to the user via UART. So port C gets 0xff so that all the LEDs are off. We're going to init the UART TRT underscore init underscore UART because I want to be able to use the interrupt driven version of I.O. I don't want to have the CPU sitting there waiting for the human. And standard, uh, standard out equals standard in equals standard error equals ampersand UART string, which was defined someplace else up above. Then we're going to init the kernel, TRT. Init kernel. And, it, and this, this function takes a parameter, which is the stack size of the idle task. It's the stack size of the idle task. And it needs to be about 80 bytes. <clears throat> we need to create some semaphores. So we're going to do a TRT create Create semaphore, and I think the first one I defined was sem sem r x i s r signal, and we're going to initialize this semaphore to value zero. So the first task which calls semaphore wait will in fact wait. There are no instances available of the resource that this semaphore is protecting. So this will force a wait the first time. It will force a wait until some task signals the semaphore.
XM string done. We're going to initialize this to zero also. And then we're going to do a create for the shared I think I called it sem share. And we're going to initialize this to 1 because when the program starts, neither task is actually using the memory. And so it's available. The first task that attempts to write to that memory is going to grab the semaphore and lock out the other task. What? Why is it not what? I'm sorry. C R E A T. Oh, because I can't spell. C R E A T E. E. The chunk of my brain that mediates spelling is has never worked right. So is it clear why these are zeros and that's a one? Now it's time to ask. So now we have to do a TRT create task. And there's a bunch of parameters here. The first one is a pointer to the to the task itself to the function, the name of the task. The second is the is the stack size that you want. The third parameter is the is the time of the first release. This is the initial release time after the start of execution. The next is the first deadline. And the last one is a pointer to the arguments that we're not using. Question? So, we have to we have to create we have to identify the functions to the operating system so it knows to treat them as a as a as a formal process yes it's a pointer pointer to arg Wrote down here ampersand. Getting the address. Get, you get, would be, uh, you, you're, it's dereferencing. Yeah. No, we're getting this is passing the address. Oh. Is there another hand up over here? And of course, we have to do a TRT create task for serial com. Going to set the task size, the the stack size to a hundred there, and seconds to ticks.
Second statistics, uh, 0 0.09. I can't write that low on the board. Second statistics zero point one zero and a pointer to args one. So at this point then, we've identified the functions which are supposed to be scheduled and given the scheduler the first estimate of when each of the tasks should execute <coughs> and define the semaphores that we need. The last thing we need to do is to write the idle task. And the idle task in this simple kernel just runs in main. What we're going to do is do a set sleep mode to sleep mode idle. Sleep mode, th this definition of uh, this symbol and the, the macro come from uh, an include file which is called uh, sleep.h. Then we're going to do a sleep enable and then the most boring possible the most boring possible while loop, while one, sleep, CPU. And then we're going to end main. <clears throat> So when nothing else is going on, we're just going to put the CPU to sleep. Yes? So even though you didn't create the idle task explicitly with like a TRT create, it still allocates gigabytes for that. Uh-huh. Because the init kernel keeps track of the of the pointer to the next available stack space. So once you get this all set up, it's kind of nice because you, you can write several tasks as if they're, each one is its own program. And as long as you handle the interaction, as long as you use the facilities that are available in the kernel to handle interaction, your life is actually simpler. So for the set sleep mode function, would you say like um, sleep mode uh, power save or power down or idle will set it into whichever yeah. system Yes, it'll so set it to a separate mode, this is just specifying which this, this is specifying once at one of seven or so possible modes. You can hit the you can hit the uh, the uh, uh, register directly rather than use that. I can't remember what it's called, the sleep mode register. And also, is the TRT handling the wake up stuff? What wake up stuff? Like when it goes to sleep and then some other like that. The interrupt, the, t the tick interrupt. Now, running in the background, which you don't see, Timer 1 is running a tick interrupt which wakes the system up every few hundred microseconds. But is that managed by the TRT or the, uh, the original pass from the like the... The interrupt, is handled, by, the interrupt is handled by TRT. Okay. 
If you wanted, you could put any code you want here. You could put a code to blink an LED if you wanted to make sure, if you wanted a heartbeat to make sure that something was actually running. There's nothing that says you have to put the CPU to sleep. Although that's a handy thing to do in a, in a, in a production system where you want to save some power. But, but there's no particular reason why you couldn't put more code here that will only be executed, will only be executed when nothing else is happening, when nothing else can be scheduled. Oh, well, you could put a, a profiler counter there. You could count how many ticks the, the system spent in idle mode, and that would tell you how much system loading you have. That might be fun to do. <clears throat> so what do you want to see next? Do you want to start, do we talk about API or do you want to see another example? You want to do PID next? So what's the feeling? PID, another TRT example, TRT API. You can read the API, it's all there. Of course you can read it all, it's all there. But uh, who wants PID? We'll do this. Ooh, actual interest. Uh, TRT example. Eh, bzzz, that's a loser. API. Well, it's, PID is a clear winner. Okay, we'll do that next. So, excuse me. Uh, PID control. So let's set up why you might want to control why 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 people use the phrase proportional integral differential for PID. Why people bother to even use those words and then try and motivate why it's important. <clears throat> so you're going to be turning on a switch in the, in the simplest way of thinking about this you're going to have a switch here to a 12 volt battery controlling the motor. This switch is actually a transistor, and it's actually on the low side, not the high side, but never mind. So you're going to flip the switch open and closed very rapidly, say 100 times a second, to implement a, a pulse width modulator control of the speed. <clears throat> and the human is going to choose the speed at which the motor should run. So the human might say, might command the motor to run at 500 hertz, 500 RPM, not hertz, 500 RPM, and then by typing a command on the PC keyboard, a putty, suddenly command the motor to run at 1000 RPM. And the control system <clears throat> then wants to, needs to do something to speed up the motor. Now presumably, and uh, hmm, what speed do these motors run if they're full, full speed at 12 volts? It's around uh, 3000 RPM, something like that. So 500 is one sixth of 3,000 RPM. So you'd guess the pulse width modulator might be running at a, a 0.16 duty cycle or so here. And here might be up to a 0.35 duty cycle or something like that. Question is, what is the best way of changing the duty cycle to get the speed of the motor 
coming to the new value as fast as possible. Well, one possibility is pedal to the metal, turn it on full blast, jump the PWM up to a 100% duty cycle until it gets to the speed you want and then turn it off. That's fast. That's as fast as you can go. Has a tendency though, you come screaming up like this, you get here you say, okay, time to turn off the PWM, except, well, we have a sample data system here, right? You don't get a new measurement of the RPM until the fan blade that's marked with the white dot comes around again. Meanwhile, for that extra rotation, which is after all, let's see, at a thousand RPM, that's how many per second? That's 30 per second, more or less, right? No, 15 per second. 60 seconds in a minute, yes, 15 per second. So it's a whole 60 milliseconds until you get the next RPM measurement, during which time you're still pedal to the metal. And so now the, the speed's up here. You say, oh, we're going too fast. You turn off the motor. It drops. Ah, oh, we're too slow. It goes back on again. And you'll get limit cycle oscillations with what's called, this is called bang-bang control. It's either full on or full off. Boom, boom. Two positions. Interestingly enough, that's how, of course, your thermostat works in your house. It's bang-bang control. <clears throat> and there's lots of controls for which that's a reasonable thing to do. You can get a little bit better performance, though, than that in this case. You can't, you can't do any better in terms of uh, speed, up, speed up time than full power. Now, with the control system we're going to be using with one battery here, you, when you turn off the power, you're not actually producing negative voltage to slow the motor down. You're just turning it off. And so it's coasting to a lower power, a lower, a lower speed. So this is actually going to be a piecewise control system. When it's under power, when the RPM is too low, you can do something to, to make it go faster. You turn on power. But when it's going too fast, when the system is going too fast, all you can do is turn off the power. <clears throat> so what are the alternatives here? Well, rather than turning on the turning on the PWM full blast and waiting until it overshoots, you could say, I'm going to decide how far I am from the desired the desired level, and the farther I am from the desired level, the more drive I'm going to put on the system. So if we're far from equilibrium, if we're far from the desired uh, speed, you're going to put full power on the motor, but as we get closer, we're going to start turning down the power. And so you turn it down until when it's at the same, at the correct speed, the power is zero. So it won't speed up anymore. That's called proportional control. So, proportional control means that the power, that the uh, voltage out is proportional to the error. <clears throat> the error being how different the actual speed is, which the error is defined as desired. minus actual speed. You're going to be measuring the actual speed with a tachometer and the desired speed is what the human commands from the command line. <clears throat> so one, so the, the easiest possibility is that the pulse width modulator ratio, which is the same as V out once it's been smoothed, is going to be proportional to some constant A times the error, 
where the error is the desired speed minus the actual speed. If actual, actual speed is less than desired, VL equals 0 if actual is greater or equal to desired. So that's proportional control. It's a little gentler than bang bang control. It takes account of the fact that as you get closer, and if you want to avoid overshoot, as you get closer to the desired speed, you ought to not put quite as much torque on the motor. So, no. So let's say now we just drop this suddenly back to 400 RPM here. Motor is sitting up here, quivering around 1,000 RPM ideally. You command it to go to 400. The only thing the command system can do, we're still, now we're suddenly in the case where actual is greater than desired. And so the system passively turns off the, the motor driver and lets the motor speed decay away exponentially to the new speed. <clears throat> That's approximately exponential. It's not really, but it's close. Because drag is approximately related to velocity. Yeah? So when you're at the desired speed, the voltage out is zero. Don't you want to end up in a situation where you're at the constant PWM for a certain speed? Yes, you do. Very good. So this says that if, if the error is zero, if I get to the point where I'm exactly on the <clears throat> exactly on the desired frequent uh, 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 RPM, that to hold that a must be infinite, because the only way to get a finite output is infinity times zero. Another way of saying this is, you like that? Yeah, it's, it's good. setting infinity on this on this processor is hard, of course. <clears throat> but, what, but let me put it slightly softer than that and say that the bigger you set A to be, qualitatively, the bigger you set A, the smaller the final error will be. Because you can't ever quite get Because of the limitations, as Jeremy said, you can't ever quite have the velocity equal, but it can get pretty close. And what I'll attempt to show you in a little while is that this error, the, the relative error, is a over 1 plus a. So if a is 10, you might expect to get within 10% here. If A is 100, you expect to get within 1%. Uh, don't you want to add a small bias voltage to the system? No, I don't want to because that varies in a difficult fashion with RPM and load. I want to make this a, just a pure closed loop, closed loop system. So there will be a systematic underestimate you will run, with this simple control system, you'll always run a little slow. The higher you turn up A, the better off you are. So why not make it enormous? It oscillates, but why does it oscillate? Well, it turns out that's a, that's a slightly technical question, I mean, in, in sort of intuitively, the reason it oscillates is for the same reason the bang bang control oscillates, that you get to right to here, you still have a, quite a lot of drive, you overshoot, you come back down again. <clears throat> if A is too big, uh, you can rephrase this in terms of phase shift, 
the control system has too much phase shift, we'll do that next time. But one way of getting around this is to add in a term which doesn't look at the error but looks at but looks at instead the integral of the error so a small error for a long time has a large integral and so you could add a term here b where b is some constant you have to choose a is a constant you're going to have to choose in lab to make the system work b is a constant you're going to have to choose in lab times some approximation of the integral from some zero to t where you're going to, you have to be a little careful about how you actually do this of error dt You're off by a constant and known amount. Why don't we just say, oh, I want you to spin at 1502 instead of 1500? Like, well, yes, okay. So it's it, it, given that the load condition that's equivalent to adding in an offset. The offset actually varies with with our actual RPM, right. but it still could be table driven. Right. And so what you what you're proposing is that that when you ask for a thousand the system says set it to 1020 yeah. Psst. and 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 give it a little more drive and and that'll work although i there's a that, that makes a nonlinearity which may depend upon load conditions in a way i don't understand but it's worthwhile trying <clears throat> now in fact you're not going to calculate an integral because this is a sample data system you have to know how long what delta t is delta oh my god oh, this is oh the pain delta t depends on how fast the system is rotating because you're going to get one measurement every cycle of the motor and so delta t is going to be proportional to 1 over the rpm but you have to multiply you have to calculate out what delta t is you have to calculate out what the error is multiply them together and add them up now in reality People don't go from zero to T, but rather they go from last crossing, last crossing to T, where last crossing means where you either went through the desired RPM in a positive direction or a negative direction. <clears throat> you reset the error you reset the integral to zero at that point. You reset the integral to zero at every crossing and then start the summation again. So now that's the P term and the I term. We still have to have the D term out here. <clears throat> Question. Just to clarify, is DT the, P, the PID uh, interval? DT is the time from one measurement to another or the time of the computation, depending on how you, how you do it. If you, if you compute at a uniform interval, then you're going, to, you're going to set delta T to the interval of your computation. If you're setting the interval to how long it takes for a rotation to occur, then that's going to vary with RPM. So you're arbitrarily choosing that history to take the account of the uh, interval? I'm not, it's not arbitrarily choosing. It's choosing from the last time it, you were dead on. So you say, the last time I'm on, I'm just going to zero everything and start over from there. Sure. You tell last two, last three, infinity. It turns out, though, that the system tends to be unstable when you do that. And the reason is that, that you always have small measurement errors. And if there's any systematic measurement error, then as you sum that over time, 
the error, the systematic error, comes to dominate the integral. And so resetting it regularly helps stability. When do you reset it? Well, you could just reset it every second arbitrarily, but it kind of makes more sense to reset it when the error is zero. The last time it was actually, the system was actually correct. <clears throat> the D term. So there's going to be a third term here, here that's going to be related to error, D error, DT, <clears throat> which of course in a sample data system is going to be actually error at t equals n plus 1 minus the error at t equals n over delta t. And why is that in there? Well, does anybody know the real system reason why that happens? Why that stabilizes? I think it's uh, uh, faster than the rate of change of the error. So it caches, caches up the set point quite fast. So, so that's the time, to, that's, the, that's the, uh, the, the, the qualitative version of it, is that it, just as you lower the drive when you're getting close to, for stability, if you find out you're changing really fast, then you better cut down the driver, you're going to overshoot. And so this is an estimate of how fast you're approaching equilibrium. The technical reason is that a differentiator has a phase shift of plus 90 degrees, minus 90 degrees, 0 or 180. Oh, this is this is time for the clickers, right? This is this is that's a perfect multiple guess question for the clickers. Okay, how many people think it's plus ninety? How many people think it's minus ninety? Ooh, how many people think it's one eighty? How many people think it's zero? Well, it's plus ninety. An integrator is minus ninety. And because you have a phase shift, it turns out that the motor itself at high frequency causes a phase shift of 180 degrees. I'm going to go through this in some detail in the next lecture. This is just a warm up. The motor itself has a phase shift of plus, of minus 180. It's an integrator. And you can stabilize it by adding a phase shift to it to phase shift it back to uh, minus 90. This is, yes, it's always zero. V out is always zero if this is true. If you're greater than, with this control system, we can't, we have no way of applying a negative voltage to the motor. With this control system, the only thing you can do if the motor's going too spa fast is to turn it off. And that's the best thing to do. Zero the voltage. <clears throat> now I wrote a little MATLAB program which simulates this mess um, and it, it takes into account the sample data uh, effects, it takes into account the piecewise linearity so the system is different under acceleration than it is under deceleration. I'm not sure it gets all the effects but it's not bad, you should start playing with it like today. Tuning this, remember I said last time, I had a student who said I could have done this in an afternoon if it weren't for the blank blank operating system. There are a few number of people, a few people who said I could have done this this afternoon if it wasn't for choosing these blank blank constants. Because 
part of the lab that you're going to be graded on is how well does the system stabilize at the new value without overshoot. Now, we're not going to get ridiculously obsessive about this, but well, the best I've seen, and I don't even know how they did this, they're, 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 was they're getting a thousand RPM plus or minus five. For uh, so it would change from 500 to a thousand, and come up and hover plus or minus five RPM. About the best I could do was about plus minus 15. This doesn't surprise me too much because there's a lot of smart students in here. So it's no surprise that they're better at it than I am. But, but uh, it was awfully good. I'd say, I'd say plus minus 15 RPM at 1,000. This is good. The, 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 because the motor is only approximately linear, <clears throat> because you have a limited voltage output of 12 volts, for various other reasons, the stability of the system is going to change depending on what RPM regime you're in. But we're going to be testing you at about 2 or 3 RPMs, typically 500 and 1,000. It better be able to step accurately up and down between 500 and 1,000 at least. <coughs> what is the lowest speed it can go? The lowest speed... <coughs> Uh, I would say the lowest speed is probably down below 100 RPM, and uh, but but the system gets hard to stabilize at low RPM because you're only making a measurement at 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 100 RPM. You're only making a measurement about once a second, and that and what's the control system going to do for that second? It's got to do something. It has to hold the value it already has, or it has to guess what the next value is going to be. And so you have, so the ten, system tends to oscillate more at low frequencies than it does at high frequencies of rotations. Yeah, I'm going to go through all the phase stuff next time. I'm going to go through the constituent equations and the whole disaster next time. Uh, you know, writing Kirchhoff's law and and F equals M A and all that kind of stuff. I just I wanted to kind of warm up the crowd with with a with a qualitative version of this first before the before the quantitative version. But before you flip the papers closed, any last questions about final project proposal? do this week. At least, yes? There's some mention of having code included. How detailed and how extensive does that need to be? It does not, code. You, if, you, if you're going to include code, I would say the level we're expecting is more like, of course, or a crude flow chart rather than details of algorithms. But if you happen to have the details of an algorithm that you've worked on be for some other reason or because you, you happen to start coding, <coughs> include that. Is there a penalty for writing a proposal that you can't finish or for downgrading it? No, there is no penalty. However, prudence suggests that the proposal you write for your sanity should have two or three or four logical stopping points. If everything goes really well, great, we're going to get here. But if it only goes pretty good, we still have something to demo here. And if, and if everything goes wrong, we still have something to demo, which is probably pretty simple. You, better, you, you should have uh, two or three levels of fallback. But no, this is a proposal. In fact, two weeks into the final project, if you decide you need to change, well, oh, what we decided to do was ridiculous and the TA didn't catch it. Sure, you could change. If it gets to be four weeks in and you decide to change, I might have something to say about it. Although I've seen that happen, I've seen it work. The people didn't look very good and they didn't smell very good at week five, but, <laughs> but it worked. So, <clears throat> uh, 
I think there's at least two TAs who have papers. Uh, Pavel yeah, lab reports. And, and Joe have lab reports. 